we'll be starting shortly. We're just letting people join us for a couple moments here. Sunshine, I'm interested to know about that picture behind your head. It's a ledger art. It's um, a popular trend where oftentimes they use like old old ledger from history books and, and then they create our indigenous art on top of it. And this one, it seems like they used music to place the art and it seems like there's a father ceremony happening. Ah, and you mentioned our indigenous ways. Talk to me about that because that was part of that conversation we were just having and planning. Yeah. So um, the family I'm supporting, whose house I'm in, were from Standing Rock Nation. And the mother is also a descendant of the Lakota people with me. And their partner is a part of the Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara tribes. They're known as the three affiliated tribes. And they were almost wiped out by smallpox completely, um, especially uh, the Hidatsa and the Arikara. And so there's not a lot of people who still speak their languages, but they lived in these beautiful earth lodges along the Missouri River. Beautiful. We, we never know who we're talking to in this world, right? <laughs> and so I, one of the things I hope for for all of us is that if we just simply treat one another equally and fairly, it doesn't matter what color you are or even what gender you are, because you get the love and respect that a human is due. I know that's kind of Pollyanna. <laughs> I really felt that um, holding space with you, and you may not remember, but it was Eco Farm in 2020, right before the pandemic hit. I was in your teaching education class and I really enjoyed your energy. It made me feel included and excited about teaching. Everybody can find themselves on the circle of diversity, right? We all belong there. And if it's a horizontal circle and we all love each other, then, you know, isn't that enough, I think, right? Because there's so many different ways to define all the packages we come in, infinite, right? <laughs> Yeah, I've been feeling a lot this last week. You know, my grandparents all came from Ukraine. Oh. And, um, but they all came at the beginning of the century, uh, of the, ninth, the 20th century, fleeing the pogroms and the persecution. And they didn't really identify themselves as Ukrainian. They identified as Jewish. And, uh, wow. um, but I was just thinking, you know, like, given that history like Zelensky being president of Ukraine it's kind of like Obama being president of the U.S. right <laughs> if they were still alive I, right you know I just uh hope and pray he survives this next uh, little bit of time. yeah how has that been affecting you especially deeply are you feeling those roots I mean I hope we're all feeling how horrific it is but yeah I I think it is really hit me. Yeah. Well, I think it's time for us to begin. So I want to welcome everybody uh, and say welcome to this conversation about permaculture and how we take permaculture education further. And um, we're going to have a little bit of a panel and then we're going to open it up for discussion and questions um, so that we can hear from you because I'm sure all of you have interesting thoughts and many valuable experiences that we can learn from. Um, so I'd like to begin by introducing Charles Williams. Um, I'm Starhawk, by the way, right, um, who is one of my teaching partners in Earth Activist Training. And he's going to begin with a little bit of a grounding because in Earth Activist Training, we always like to ground ourselves in spirit. I also want to just say, um, introduce Guy and Isis, who is interpreting for us so beautifully tonight. 
Uh, and to give a good shout out and a thanks to Maya Norton, who's lurking here, who is our administrative director and who does so much of the behind the scenes stuff that um, makes all of this actually run and all of this possible. So, Charles, you want to ground us. Welcome, everybody. I invite you to just take a moment and uh, get comfortable wherever you are. Just feel your chair or where you're standing. Just like get comfortable and maybe take a deep breath and relax. Let go of anything from the day. Just let it all go so you can be here for this hour. Feel your feet on the ground or your body held, nestled in wherever you're sitting. And just allow your awareness to settle down to the earth below you. Imagine your awareness as threads or roots going to the floor, down deep into the earth. What does it feel like to be here right now? What does the earth where you are right now feel to you? Cold. Let those threads of awareness, those roots go down deeper. Just breathe them with an out breath. Just blow them down a little farther. And see if you can taste this place you call home today. Just draw some of the energy of this place in and notice what that feels like. Just draw it up and breathe it in. Into your body into your legs, breathe it up into your hips, your belly. Your shoulder, your chest, around your heart, your head. And let some of it sprout out like seed a shoot going up through the roof and into the sky, dancing with the fading sunlight. If you're somewhere, it's still daylight or maybe moonlight or starlight. And breathe in some of this night. This late afternoon. Allow yourself just to be here between earth and sky between air and ground. I invite you to open your eyes and take a look, look around, notice your space, notice this screen with all these wonderful people. And just become here for tonight. Welcome everybody. Welcome here, welcome grounded. Um, pass this off to sunshine. I always appreciate your groundings, Charles. Thank you for bringing us into this space in a healthy way. And I would like to, as I reflect on some conversations previous, uh, share that um, beyond acknowledgments, we need to prioritize understanding that the comfort we have in a lot of ways to be here now has been built off the lives of many people from diverse backgrounds, whether it be the indigenous, the people of color, many um, migrant workers have been enslaved and forced into labor in order to create the society that we have now. And I'm currently sharing space on territory that's known as the Salish lands. 
in the Pacific Northwest. And I've also spent time with other elders on the island called um, Across the Way. And they're the Suquamish Nation, whose elder took me into their home and honored me like a granddaughter. And we would share a morning drink and watch the hummingbirds. And I would help her harvest apples and pick blackberries. And even though we were from different nations, we looked to each other's relatives. And those are the types of experience that we want to continue to breathe life into as people on earth, regardless of our diverse backgrounds. And um, I come from the Ocheti Shakoe Nation, which is a band of seven indigenous tribes. Uh, we are Dakota, Nakota, and Lakota people, but my matrilineal heritage is of the Lakota and Dakota people. So uh, often we greet ourselves with other people saying, Chante mawashte nape chiyuzapi. And I would like to greet you with a heartfelt handshake. So welcome tonight, and I'm glad to be here together. I am really grateful to be with you, Sunshine, and grateful for that. Um, that uh, hits my heart close. I like that I, mind you, I just pulled it off the laundry pile, but I like this rainbow for tonight um, because we can all exist somewhere on that spectrum and shine brightly and in a healing way. Um, I will be facilitating tonight um, in uh, hopefully some light-handed ways, but am very honored to do so because Starhawk and Charles are very directly responsible for Wanda legitly being able to call herself a permaculturalist. And what I love most about <clears throat> that experience of earth activist training wasn't so much how to grow a beautiful garden, right? Which I am very blessed to have, but how to look at how to grow beautiful and beloved community among the people I steward. And I will tell you that I have been heard to say recently, I'd rather be growing pomegranates than people. And <laughs> pomegranates are hard to grow. <laughs> But people have really been, you know, we're in these really hard times and, and everybody's struggling um, and, and thriving also. I have to say I've been thriving. Um, but I think it's important for us to take a look at how to take these lovely permaculture principles. And by the way, I don't care who created them. I love that we all created them. I don't care who thought to write them down. They're a set. It's a framework that can help us understand plants, people, and our planet. And that's what we need right now. So I think what we're going to talk about is deepening um, uh, the learnings that we can apply to the way in which we do this world. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Starhawk, because um, at least in my world, it starts with her. Oh, thank you, Wanda. You're welcome. I'm Starhawk, and I came to permaculture after many years of writing and teaching about earth-based spirituality and feminism and activism. Um, I wanted to take a permaculture course ever since I heard about it, which was sometime in the late 80s. A friend of mine had taken a course, and... I just thought it was really fascinating and I've always loved gardening and all those skills, um, even though that's not all there is to permaculture. Um, but I finally met a wonderful woman named Penny Livingston Stark. Uh, and she was teaching permaculture and invited me to co teach a course with her. And I said, Well, how can I teach it? I don't know anything about it. And she said, Well, I'll just teach the permaculture. You can sort of, she didn't frame it this way, but I did. You can teach sort of the woo-woo spiritual aspects. <laughs> and that's what we did. And then um, I went home and tried to put permaculture into practice and 
found, hmm, this is not as easy as it sounds when you're just sitting there learning the principles. Um, but after a couple of years, Penny and I both went to a big demonstration in Seattle against the WTO in 1999. And it was tremendously empowering and exciting. And when it was over, we got together at one point and we were saying, you know, there's all these activists out there that are just they have so much energy and they're just on fire with wanting to change the world but they don't necessarily know what the tools and the skills are or what they want to change it into and there's all these permaculturalists who have all these incredible skills and approaches and answers and solutions but sometimes they're a little bit naive about the power relations that are keeping them from being put into practice so can we bring these things together? And that's how we founded Earth Activist Training. And we began teaching. And at first, I kind of co-taught some of the permaculture design courses with Penny. Um, for those, I sort of assuming a lot of you who are here because you are familiar with permaculture and maybe have already done a permaculture design course. But for those of you who are new to permaculture, you know, permaculture really is a whole system of ecological design. And there is, a, it's also a kind of a global movement of practitioners that span sort of agriculture, uh, regenerative agriculture in many different forms, things like holistic management grazing, things like urban gardens and community gardens, and also more and more are beginning to say, well, these ecological principles work pretty well in creating systems. How do we apply them to human systems? Um, and there's a basic course, the permaculture design course. It's a 72 hour curriculum that was originally put together by Bill Mollison, who was one of the founders of permaculture and some of his students. And that's kind of generally recognized as like the entryway into the permaculture world. So Penny and I taught a bunch of those together. I think I must have co-taught with her six or seven times before I taught without her. And it was a very like <laughs> nervous moment of like, oh no, <laughs> now I have to know all this stuff. And uh, we're going to build with Cobb and I don't have a penny there to hold my hand and tell me if I'm doing it right or wrong. Um, but now that was more than 20 years ago. Um, at one point I had to count up the permaculture design courses I had taught uh, when I applied for my diploma with PINA, the Permaculture Institute North America. And uh, at that time I taught more than 50. So. Um, it's been a challenge in the last couple of years to take those courses and put them online with COVID. Um, but I found myself really looking at the question in the broadest possible way, looking at the question about climate change and the uh, meltdown, literal meltdown of the environment and the ecosystems that it represents and saying, well, what, what can we do about it? And I think in permaculture, one of the things we recognize is that climate change is not just carbon numbers. Uh, climate change represents massive ecosystem degradation on a global scale. Um, so the answer to it is massive ecosystem regeneration on a global scale. And the positive thing is we actually know how to do ecosystem regeneration. That's a lot of the solutions. It's a lot of great um, resources and things that we have in the permaculture world, the regenerative agriculture world. Um, so thinking about that, thinking, well, what do we need to do that on a global scale? Well, we need three things. We need land to do it on. We need resources and money to do it. And we need people that know how to do it. And with Earth Activist Training, 
Uh, we're not a wealthy organization. We don't have access to massive amounts of money or resources. Um, some of us in Earth Activist Training have land, but um, we're not like land barons or, you know, billionaires who could go out and buy up massive amounts. But what we do know how to do is teach people. So I began thinking about how do we teach people beyond the PDC? Um, how do we teach people in a bit more depth? And we began in 2019 with a program we started calling Regenerative Land Management. Um, and then COVID hit in 2020, and we have had to rethink, readjust, and reconfigure. And, but we are still teaching regenerative land management as a roughly two-year program in connection with the Permaculture Institute of North America that can offer a permaculture diploma um, and doing much of it online, but also finding ways that people can learn the practical skills with internships and with opportunities to practice. The other part of expanding permaculture education for me is taking it beyond what I call the usual suspects. You know, in, at least in the US, permaculture, like many alternative things, tends to be adopted most quickly by people who have some level of education and privilege. And that's fine, that's good. I can't think of anything better to do with your privilege than learn permaculture and practice it and teach it and share it. But there's a lot of people on the front lines of environmental struggles. There's a lot of communities who are really impacted by things like food insecurity and food deserts who really could benefit by having access to some of the tools and some of the techniques of permaculture. So the other question we have is like, how do we broaden that? Um, Earth activist training has done that in a couple ways. One is by volunteering and by sharing our skills with community organizations that are doing things and needing some help with it. Uh, the other is by offering diversity scholarships and just really sort of extending a handout to different communities, not a handout, but a hand out, right? <laughs> Uh, to just say, hey, welcome, you know, we value your participation and we value it enough to try to make access easy. And I, um, I really think we have done a lot to broaden the scope of who's learning permaculture, at least here in the United States and, and Canada. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Charles, uh, who's sort of my co-teaching buddy, and uh, let you introduce yourself a bit and maybe say a bit more on this topic. Hello. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Charles. Um, hold on a second. I'm also managing our tech right now, so I need to read it's on my screen here. Okay. Uh, so my name is Charles, and I teach with Earth Activist Training. I'm also working with the Deanery Project, and I recognize some people here who are with that community in Nova Scotia. Um, and I guess there's two pieces that I, when I think about uh, where to go next with permaculture, like how to continue on the education. Um, and one is continuing the learning. Um, you know, that's why we have our regenerative land management course and our regenerative land design <clears throat> um, uh, course. So we've tried to, in Earth Actors training, we've tried to look at what, where are the areas that we really need to focus and try to build some trainings around those. How can we get more ecological theory? Um, understand how the world works. Uh, I think many of us grew up in a time where we were abstracted from the natural world. So understanding how it works and why it works and what are the systems, um, we really need to be introduced to. We need to be brought back into that uh, because, you know, even now, you know, I have a six-year-old son and like how many leaves can you 
identify? How many plants can you identify in the natural world versus how many logos? Like, it's really easy to get a, a moved out of the natural um, systems out of the natural world. So I think part of the work that we're doing in our programs is really deepening the understanding of how the world works. Right? How does it work? And helping digest some of the science. Um, you know, reading the those you know, terribly interesting, you know, documents like the IPCC report that keeps you up late at night um, because it's a, you know, exciting read and you just can't put it down. Um, so reading through those and figuring, figuring out how to teach uh, these complex issues, uh, complex topics in a way that, that moves us forward, but also not just as like a scientist activity or heady activity, but as a, a piece of activism, a piece of um, social organizing. So how do we understand what's going on in the ecological world, but also in the context of our human uh, interactions, um, whether it be bylaws and building codes or whether it is like social interactions, like how do we relate to each other? Because a lot of the ecological cycles and our social processes are very similar um, and they're founded on some of the same kind of theories and permaculture principles can apply to both. So we, we teach this set of like, how do the world work? Um, but we're also been doing more teaching of like, how do we then engage with it? Like, what do you do and how do you do it? Like, how do you, how do you manage with fire? Like we understand fire theory, but like, how do you do, how do you do it? How do you manage with livestock or how do you, um, you know, build soil? Like, how does that actually happen in the real practical nuts and bolts sort of way? Um, so I think throughout our courses, um, the ones that we have coming this year are really about that. Uh, what is the theory, or like our regenerative land design, our RLD course, but also how do you engage with that there? We have a disaster, um, designing for disasters class. Like how do you actually design uh, in preparation for these disasters that are coming, whether it's fire or flood or earthquake or, you know, whatever is coming along, how do you prepare for that not knowing what it will be? Or how do you... Um, you know, start a business like what are practical things about like having um you know, a business what are some of the practical things about um, you know having a a a piece of land and managing it? like how do you actually manage for nutrient flows or install solar panels or um, deal with treating water so, so we have different classes that deal with these various things which i think is part of our important work um, the other end of it is the social part piece, which we have our social permaculture course, empowering group collaborative groups, but also within all of our organizing, like how do we empower um, people who are interested in permaculture to be able to, to implement it in their lives? So it's in, um, sorry. So it's bringing together um, groups of people, but figure out how to have a diverse community, whether it's um, inviting a deaf community in and finding ways in which to do that, um, communities of color, people, marginalized um, communities, um, and also modeling that in our teaching. How do we model um, the world that we want in the programs that we make? So I think that's a lot of the work that we do. And in that modeling and sharing and working collaboratively, I'm gonna pass it on um to our our next folks um, i don't actually want to remember who is next in the, the lineup oh is that sunshine? sunshine sunshine okay well i'm gonna pass it on to sunshine so i uh have a background in environmental science from our tribal college it's called sitting bull college on standing rock reservation and so speaking of modeling, I graduated with my degree after four years and was like, okay, so I can do research and I know the environment's messed up. It's kind of obvious. But years later, I was introduced to the concept of permaculture, which as Wanda mentioned, is a framework for a set of principles that guides our decision-making process when we are looking at a landscape and how we interact with it locally and often in community. So I um, have done many social justice efforts and many have heard of our reservation Standing Rock because of our stance to protect our water which where we live, I live in an island in the middle of a river when I'm home on the reservation. 
So the water surrounds us. It gives us life even as we begin in our mother's wombs. And so I, as an environmentalist, realized that I can't get people to care about the environment if they don't care about themselves or their community. And so that's where breathing life into those relationships is really essential and learning to listen and understand each other is important. So uh, during that camp we had, I was pregnant with my first child and I would bike for miles looking for donations for things like solar panels and warm clothes to help my people make a stance that was impactful. And I would pick trash until my back hurt, but I felt like I was making a difference in a little way. And after I had my child away from the reservation, I I left because I didn't feel safe there. And I relocated across the country, which somehow magically I was woven into Earth Activist, which Starhawk was a book on my shelf at the time, but not a human that I knew and was introduced to. And um, now I often hear people who are inspired by her stories that talk about a different world of cooperation where people are growing food and honoring each other's diversity. And that book was written almost 30 years ago. (laughs) Uh, uh, Fifth Sacred Thing. But I, um, after my PDC, realized that it activated a fire inside me. So I started building memorial gardens and spiral gardens and learning more about how I felt like I had a purpose and I have recovered from addiction and permaculture is now an addiction that I feel is way healthier and I can share it with people I love and transform their spaces in small, slow ways that make an impact on their own liveliness. And so eventually I took a permaculture teacher's training and I kept taking earth activist courses because I met so many people who had a similar vision for change and not just complaining about the things that were happening, but doing something about it for themselves and each other. So I felt really happy to have this toolbox of different skills that I was developing and I excitedly went to the reservation was like we're going to do everything all these projects and so many ideas but I realized that they don't happen overnight because of our spirits and how we need to have that connection to our culture and so we have hosted events like um, tree planting where we plant hundreds and thousands of different trees in community orchards or restoring our flooded riverbanks that the Army Corps installed dams along our rivers, which caused our fertile fruit food forests to be flooded. So that created a disconnect to our health and the land that provided all the nutrients for our relatives to thrive and to sustain themselves to this day. So Permaculture has inspired me in a lot of ways to practice natural building was one of my favorite skills to get my hands in cob is like therapy way better than going to any talking therapist because I feel like I work out things that I didn't even know were inside me and I have done small projects with kids with cob and that's a magical experience in themselves because we're in society always trying to bleach and clean and and kids can just go crazy and be messy and it's a part of the process and be themselves and get creative. So that has been really exciting um, to do more of. Uh, Finally, I chose to do the regenerative land management program because I was like, what's the next steps? Let's keep doing this. (laughs) And I started as a student with the first cohort in 2019 And like I said, the the people who I meet keep bringing me back because my personal network grows, but my heart expands with every deepened um, interaction and learning more of other people's stories and how they're doing their own part in the world has 
pushed me to continue. And so um, I didn't give up and I now coordinate that program. So I tried to help other people meet their learning goals in permaculture after their PDC by developing skills, connecting with internship sites where they can um, find opportunities to learn more of their interests. And that's been really awesome to hear the stories come through people drive having control over their learning and flexibility because I'm a single mother. My child has come to all trainings, every internship. I've been able to find the right space that fits for me and my lifestyle. So it's been really rewarding in that way. And I, through that, right before the pandemic hit, I was at Eco Farm Conference, like I said, and Wanda's energy in permaculture education. Again, I have a whole Google Drive of photos I took of the books that you shared and the lesson plans because I was like, these are golden and I want to activate my own communities and give them energy like you gave me. So thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, that was that was a very fun and that was, yeah, huh? The last eco farm before the pandemic and a very powerful one there was even a protest and a takeover of the annual event there was right remember there was quite a lot we were doing that year um i am wanda stewart and i am the executive director now of an organization called common vision and common vision originally was started um by what uh self-professed hippies who wanted to plant a lot of trees in school gardens in the hood. Um, while they were doing that, um, I, at, I did a lot of school administration. I worked in boarding schools, right? Before everyone was sort of living in these communal houses that we lived, I lived with all of my students and raised my children and my animals and myself among um, an intentional community about education. <clears throat> and by the time I uh, was aligned with uh, Common Vision, I had been uh, simply planting um, a particular garden at a school called Hoover Elementary in West Oakland, should you be from there. And um, six years ago, it was a lot of Bermuda grass that had been cut up and rolled off. Um, and I was asked to help build a garden there. Um, the principal who did that said, I said, well, what do you want in your garden? And she said, I don't know. I just want you to grow a garden and I want you to keep the kids out there. Mm -hmm. Okay. She was like, oh, it needs food. These kids are really hungry. Um, and we got to growing this garden, me and um, a set of students who were in kindergarten to fifth grade. Um, and uh, what I would say about deepening um, my use of permaculture really is about applying it to the people. It, it actually, truly, let me back up, stacking functions, right? I was charged with helping kids learn how to grow food and feeding them and growing a garden, which I also, I do not exempt myself from that. So I'm trying to grow me. So we were doing that piece. And then as we started growing our gardens, what I also discovered was that we were cultivating community, right? So how, the, and these are kids in the hood, right? When, when Starhawk says, let's take it to the front lines, I went straight to the little kids in the hood, right? And so there they are trying to figure out how to get along, how to make it in a pretty harsh world that they got. Um, and across all that was different for them. There were Yemeni kids, there were Mexican kids, there were black kids. Every year there was sort of one rotating white kid, right? A few Southeast Asian kids. And how are we all gonna get along in the hood where crazy things can also happen? Um, and then I also quickly, quickly realized that even if none of those first two goals were achieved, that I was still making the positive impact on the planet that we expect permaculture to do, right? So it became this ultimate stacking function. Um, you know, we're talking in the chat about the value of stories. 
uh, Sunshine refu reference, putting your hands in the soil. What I learned really quickly was put a whole bunch of little badass black boys that can't sit still in the classroom and who can only fight each other on the playground, giant asphalt playground. Let's make a dig pit so you all can just dig your hearts away, right? Um, and, you know, I mentioned that Bermuda grass. The baby version of this garden had crazy Bermuda grass, right? A hundred square foot. And it required constant cardboard mulching, which Starhawk was the first person to teach me how to do that, right? Let make a cardboard, lasagna, spaghetti, whatever we called it, and mix all these things and knock out the grass as well. But again, it was a hundred squeak fit a hundred feet square. And therefore that took a whole lot of cardboard and a whole lot of mulch. And the children at Hoover Elementary learned how to become expert mulchers, right? So now here's the social emotional piece, right? And that that um, um, cross-cultural stuff. You, when we had real, 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 I cannot speak, real wheel barrows um, for these kids, right? Full-size adult wheelbarrows with just a single uh, wheel on the front of it, right? Not the cheat ones now that you don't have to work to balance. And these babies could move a whole barrow full of mulch, even though they were a kindergartner. And they learned really quickly about their personal balance, because that's really what it takes to move it, how to hold that, how to do it, maybe how to race the guy next to you to see who's best at it, right? Um, and work. They also had to learn teamwork, right? Because we've got to get the wheelbarrows full. You got to move it across the grass. You got to get it to the cardboard. The people who are laying the cardboard have to make sure it's wet because it really does make a difference. Wet your cardboard, people, before you put the mulch on top. And we learned and each class learned a process. Each kid learned what their passion was in the process. They learned how the sum total of their behavior help the process. They learned that if you don't stay focused on what you're doing, right, it doesn't work. They learned and experienced immediate success, right? Because when you're cardboard mulching and you got all this grass and these weeds, you lay the cardboard down and you're, you put the mulch on and you go, wow, this looks beautiful, right? Instant success. And yet they also had to learn about extended effort over time because Miss Wanda would bring 39 cubic yards of mulch and drop it on the playground, right? So they also had the opportunity to ski down it and toboggan down it. They just run and play. These are children that don't even necessarily get to play outside, much less roll on the ground and not get hurt, right? So we did this, like it was the main thing we did and we planted seeds and we did all that and we got chickens and we built buildings. But this cardboard mulching changed the culture of the school. So at some point, the principal who did not buy into this idea of the garden, not the original one that hired me, but the one that replaced her, that's a thing in school, came to me and I was like, hey, Hey, did the test scores go up? This has been like four years in. She said, yeah, they really went up. The English language learners, their English proficiency has gone up 25%. And she had all of these measures. And I said, boy, the garden really did help. And she said, what would the garden have to do with the test scores? Hmm. Right? But well, when I could talk about a particular class's ability to work as a team and the kid named Jamari whose behavior was always a distraction to everyone's learning 
and he understands his impact during the test taking and at least he's quiet so everyone else can demonstrate what they know, that's teamwork, mm. right? Um, understanding what your passions are and all of the things that just listed really did change these children's lives. Um, I felt like I could go away from this school the day that I was explaining to them that I was going back to Philadelphia because my father was dying and I was going to say goodbye. Mm -hmm. And a couple of those same badass boys I referenced in the far back corner, what I hear them say is, oh, there goes that life cycle again, mm. right? To be able to take kids for whom the life cycle can be really pretty treacherous and give them the information and the demonstration in a practical way by being out in the environment, right? Watching butterflies come from caterpillars and on and on gives them, I think, the main tools they need to survive, right? That they can go out into the world and know that life goes on. Um, so uh, talk about deepening. I, I never went into Oakland's public school saying, I'm going to teach these children permaculture. Hmm. Never did. I'm not even sure your little kids. I don't even think I ever said, here are the permaculture principles. But we modeled it in the garden we grew. We learned it and demonstrated in the people we became. And now that garden is just a remarkable food forest that has taught people how to be in real community with one another. So the last quick story is March 13th, 2020. And boy, is that day coming up on us. Mm. Uh, that's the day that Oakland closed schools. And I didn't know what to do except to pick food and feed the children. So we had this beautiful permaculture, purple collard green, great perennial crop, purple collard green trees. And it was March, so they were royal and glorious. And we took big bags and we went and picked all the leaves and the kids were harvesting the foods and everybody went home with food for their families. And there were four herbs that were just all over the garden. I might've even called them weeds. Mullen, mint, oregano, and plantain. And we recognize those as herbs for respiration. And if you remember, in the beginning of the pandemic, we were sure what was gonna happen was a lung thing, right? So these kids took all this stuff home and I sat down and I cried because never felt so empowered. First of all, when people said, why are you growing food in your front of your house, in your front lawn? I used to say, because me and my people are gonna be able to eat in an apocalypse. And whoa, we were in apocalypse and wait, I was gonna be able to eat. And we were also able to feed these children and they had the medicine with them and they knew what to do with it. And in fact, it was a perennial crop. So they knew how to multiply it, right? And so the babies could feed their families, could continue to feed their families and know how to do it and work with each other. Um, and so that's how I spent the pandemic is continually uh, trying to model this behavior socially and do it in terms of the environment and in these gardens. And literally what I hope, what I think I see is that things are certainly falling apart on our planet. And I'm now positioned, and I think we who know permaculture can all be positioned to trans transition into a better and brighter world, right? where we do know that there's no difference between people and the plants, right? Um, and we can take care of the planet. Um, and we're, whenever, wherever we're going, we're gonna need to eat, right? And we need the babies of the future to do that.
So, um, yeah, make it deep, Starhawk. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Yes. Thank you so much. I yes. want to, I'm hoping we can open it up now to see if you have questions or comments. I see some amazing permaculture folks there in our uh, meeting uh. today. So. We're gonna, hi everyone, my name is Maya. Uh, we're gonna start off, we have a really beautiful question from Sophia about land rematriation. And Sophia, you're welcome to speak it out. Greetings. Thank you all so much for this beautiful program. Um, I'm in Maine um, on the land of Wabanaki nations, specifically Penobscot land. Uh, my question uh, is maybe layered, um, but I hope I can be clear. Um, I'm wondering about uh, the ethics and question and dynamics about purchasing land. Um, my kind of political and ethical understanding uh, is in is that private property ownership is kind of a root <laughs> cause of violence and in, in a system that is very, very full of problems. Um, and so, uh, but then purchasing land, like what that looks like, and then um, how we should be re rematriating land to indigenous people and rejecting the concept of private property ownership. Um, and then those related issues about like control and decision-making regarding land. And so, um, I'm curious about different considerations as well as best practices. Um, this, uh, I, I'm hearing a lot about relationships and I've done a lot of, you know, I'm, I've done a lot of kind of the more political type of organizing and definitely recognize like it's about people doing things together. Um, and so, uh, however, I'm, I'm curious about what best practices you all know and, and considerations. Thank you so much for taking the question. Um, my bandwidth is really low, so I think I shouldn't start my video. We can try. We can. I can give a little wave. This is me. Hello. Hello. Hi. Thank you. Um, I mean, I could say a little bit about that. Just, I think there's sort of our ideals about the world we want to live in and that we're working toward, and then there's like the practicalities of the world we're actually living in and what's best to do in the moment. And I would say, yeah, and in the ideal world, we don't have private property in the world that we actually live in right now. Sometimes buying and holding a piece of land might be the best and simplest way to protect it. True but that. there is a vehicle for holding land that is a community land trust or a conservation land trust uh, which is one option for taking land off the speculative market. Um, and the land trust can hold a piece of land or it can hold easements on a land, piece of land to protect it. Um, and they can be really, really helpful in making sure every piece of land on the planet doesn't get bought up and turned into speculation. Um, I know I see my stepdaughter's on here, Monica Skye, and she lived in uh, Martha's Vineyard on a land trust uh, that allowed for low-income people to have access to land. Uh, I think it's really good to ask those questions. Um, I'll also say in the Bay Area, there is uh, a wonderful um, institution now called the Shumi Land Tax for Indigenous People, where uh, the, it was started by the um, Ohlone people in the East Bay with the idea that if you own a piece of land there, you should pay a tax to the Indigenous people. And um, a lot of people do that and you calculate a percentage of what you own. You know, it's not a huge amount. It's maybe $40, $50 a month, um, more or less, depending what your property might be so-called worth. Um, but the idea is that's then 
creating resources where the tribe can buy back some of the land and have access to their own land once again. And I think that is another wonderful best practice for helping to uh, rematriate some of that land. Right, land back has been a big theme for many people and it's it, um, encouraged to look in your region and even consider some of the low income people that may have been taken advantage of due to gentrification and the, the more recent history of the land. It doesn't have to be just the indigenous people who are stewarding before colonialization. Um, there's a few different virtual resources where you can identify the history of your land and um, offer yourself reflection to check about your intentions with um, that effort and not to center yourself, but uh, uplift what's already happening with these colored or indigenous communities in your local area. If you do, are you are someone of privilege using your voice in important meetings that might be involved in city council or any state or public meetings where you can use your voice to uplift their efforts is a good way to help pass out their resources or encourage the conversation to be deeper. And uh, like Starhawk said, just um, giving, giving back the land itself in different ways to those communities, if you have that opportunity. Um, I, I would also add, I, I live in Berkeley. Um, it is a lonely land and <clears throat> one of the things that is now coming forward in Berkeley is a rematriation and a return for Black folks who were priced out of Berkeley. One of the things that's not known about Berkeley is in the 60s with People's Park and all of that, Berkeley's Black population was as high as 60%. And I promise you now that it is less, it's like somewhere around 5%. So Berkeley City Council, in the way in which Berkeley seeks, seeks to be progressive, is looking at bringing back the Black folks to Berkeley and making it possible for them to be among those um, who benefit from all of the housing initiatives that are going on in our city. And there's also um, Soul Fire Farm in uh, upstate New York, Leah Pennyman wrote a wonderful book on, uh, I think it's called Farming While Black, right? Uh, but they have a program for reparations. You know, it's the idea of, as we said at the beginning, so much of this country was built on stolen labor as well as stolen land. And um, to contribute money if you can so that we can people of color can have more access to land and have more black farms and um yeah you know what they did they actually wrote into their deed mm -hmm. that uh, when they purchased that land in new york mm -hmm. their deed says that it can only be sold to people of color mm. right and they created um in the agreements not just in the way they steward the land um, in a regenerational way, but um, ensuring for the future what happens to that land in a very intentional way. Hmm. Great, is there another question? Roxanne, would you like to ask your question for Wanda? unmute myself. Um, I've been putting comments up all the way through. So I think I had one for you, Wanda, uh -huh. going back about, um, so it was just within the story you were telling about the principal, um, whether they, while it's quite obvious to everybody here that this is what has made the difference to the um, to the response of the children and their learning. Yes. That did the principal concede that in the end? Uh, sort of, kind of, um, and it took a lot of work. 
and let me not also just put it on the teacher. There were, um, t uh, on the principal, there were teachers that had um, a lot of resistance to the idea of a garden um, or the idea or, or bringing their classes out to it, except for now in the pandemic. The pandemic in many ways was a real, um, ignited a lot of energy all over the country, but certainly in schools around, we all are looking for healthy fruits and vegetables to eat now and we wanna grow our own food, right? We All the teachers and all the kids wanna teach and learn outside because that's where it's safest to be. We all know that we gotta figure out this social part because you know we're, killing each other. Um, and we all uh, would, no one will argue about climate change anymore, right? And what I love about the state of California, uh, it is expected that environmental education is embedded in academic curriculum K to 12. So everybody's sort of coming along and the community support and the growth of the kids is kind of now not to be denied. So the principal is working really hard. But I will tell you that, you know, at the end of the day, we're all who we are individually, no matter what our roles are, right? So the truth of that principle is that she has a horrible diet. The truth of that principle is that she had breast cancer when she was 30 years old, and they told her it was about her diet, right? Um, so she... <laughs> And she eats a lot of candy, right? I lost my mind. I went into her office and there were Skittles on the table so that the kids could eat them when they were in her office in trouble, right? Like, so there is, um, there's that individual learning piece that is a way harder nut to crack than her professional role as principal. So um, like a good garden, we all grow in time. Right, and so she's getting there. And sometimes that ball rolls downhill a little bit, but we push it back up and we're all doing better than we were. I wanted to mention one other way, um, one other effort we have going, um, you know, when the U.S. pulled out of Afghanistan, it left a lot of people in a really bad situation. And a friend of mine who's one of our Earth Activist training students who had been working with a group there for 10 years who were doing human rights work and peace work and permaculture. And they suddenly found themselves on the Taliban's death lists and running for their lives. Mm -hmm. So we've been working with an international group of permaculturalists trying to find places for them to mm -hmm. go and trying to raise money. And we've succeeded in finding some places. Um, we've got places now for five people in Canada, two different families through um, with the help of OUR Eco Village, which is a wonderful intentional community that we teach at as well. Um, there's another group that was able to find places in Portugal. So we're still raising money. We still need about another eight to $10,000 to help bring these people over because it's very, very expensive go through that process. So I know Maya can put our donation thing in the chat if any of you have some spare change. Um, it's a really helpful thing to do to help support people who uh, have had to leave their homes and are really fleeing for their lives. And I'm really hopeful that um, Charles and I are gonna be able to teach in person again <laughs> in the spring in up in our eco village and some of the people that we've been working for will actually be able to be there and come and join in the class but i think that's another way of taking permaculture further is thinking how do we actually organize networks of support and i have to say the permaculture community overall has been really supportive of these efforts the hard part has been the governments and the visa requirements 
Carmen, you're invited to speak. Thank you so much. I wanted to say um, how important I think the diversity scholarships are. Um, and thank you so much again still um, to Earth Activist Training for supporting one of the tribal elders to come out to a permaculture design course. Um, I've been working with tribal nations. I'm an environmental specialist specialized in drinking and surface water quality science. And I was working on some permaculture projects on some uh, tribal lands up in Northern Nevada. We actually got a grant from the state of Nevada to build some rain gardens and um, building the support in the community, of course, is always the most difficult um, piece of the puzzle, as well as getting things like tribal councils on board um, to understand what's going on. And the process started with the kids for us. The kids were hungry and needed food. And at our meetings, we always had food. So the kids would come. But then the elders were wondering what the heck we were doing, making all this mess and this thing we were calling a garden. It didn't look like a garden. It just looked like a big pile of mess. And the elders came and wondered what the heck we were doing. And turns out they were quilters. And, and they were really good at designing and building things um, better than we were doing. So the elders started uh, directing the kids. And one of those elders um, was one that came to the permaculture design course. And, it was an essential element and, and she had been on tribal council so she knew how to you know uh, talk the talk and walk the lines that I wasn't as good at as an egg-headed scientist you know in the lab and so it really um, became a beautiful little garden space in that tribal area and someone from that tribe actually um, contacted me about two weeks ago and asked me to come back up for Earth Day. Wow. And they are still um, interested in, you know, um, how to make their land more uh, full of life. And so that one scholarship is still paying dividends in bringing life back to the land and hope when we're building that garden um, and the elders and the kids were there. Uh, I'll have to send you a picture of it, Starhawk. Yeah. On that day we were working, the tribal elders said, we haven't done this since before boarding school. Yeah. And that's when it became clear to me that this is how we heal. This is how we heal the wounds of all the, all the horrible things that have happened. And it's so simple, uh, Penny also is one of my teachers and she always says this quote and I think she heard it from someone else but the problems are complex but the solutions are embarrassingly simple and so um, you know my support for the diversity programs um, they are essential also uh, steps forward um, that I have in my uh, radar I do a lot of work with educating the educated, scientists, decision makers, um, Congress people, senators, all the people that have their hands on the ability to allow us to heal the earth. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the only reason they let me in the door is because I'm a scientist. Um, but then watch out, because I'm gonna come with the truth and tell you the whole thing when I get there. So, um, Whatever a way that we have to interface with our decision makers in our area, it's all local. All yeah. the work in this area for the advocacy for us to do this work is local and and we all have the power to do that. So that's one thing I focus on. And you don't have to be a scientist to do it. Um, any citizen has the right to have an opinion about how we manage our lands. And so we being the people that want to care and tend to those lands, I think we need to take that responsibility very seriously these days. And um, that's it. The only other thing I would say is if you hear about um, anybody 
uh, in any disadvantaged community, tribal or otherwise, that's working on a permaculture project, some of the best uh, help that I've gotten has been somebody willing to come out with me for a week or a weekend. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it, it's so exhausting to feel like you're working alone in this like uphill battle in the middle. I live in the desert, I'm in Nevada, in the middle of nowhere in the dirt. Like I'm standing here with my shovel and no one showed up to my meeting and nothing good is ever gonna happen. And I think I wanna give up. And sometimes that outside energy um, people will come to the meetings for some reason when it's not just my face <laughs> showing up and, and then having that encouragement, like just of another person that says, don't give up. And every place I've been so far still has gardens that are growing. Northern Nevada in Fallon, uh, Washoe Tribe, the Owens Valley Bishop Paiute Tribe. Um, I actually worked on a project in the Owens Valley where we built some swales in an area where they had ancient swales. It's to my knowledge, the oldest swale system in the United States built by Paiute people and they're still working and harvesting water. So yeah, just thank you for the work that you're doing. You know, all my love is with, with you and uh, yeah, once I hit the lottery, I'm gonna just give you all my money. <laughs> oh, well, now there you go. Yeah. Uh, now, now that hopefully COVID is waning a bit and we might be traveling and visiting more, like feel free to reach out if you've got programs and want someone to come and help. And part of our regenerative land management, our students need to do projects and internships. So it would be great for some of them to be able to come out and help you with some of those things. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And say hi to Barbara. I will. Wonderful having her in the course. I'll be out there in April. Great. Thank you so much, Carmen. And just a reminder for anyone who didn't see it in the chat before, every course that we offer at all times has diversity scholarships available for indigenous peoples and peoples of color um, who want to join us. It's a free scholarship. We say pay what you can, which means if you can make a contribution, please do. If you can't, we welcome you regardless. So um, you can always reach out to us if you're interested in that now, or if you see something coming in the future, just let us know. I'll put our support email in the chat again, in case you missed it. It's support at earthactivisttraining.org. Um, and since I'm speaking, Shauna also has a question and Shauna, feel free to jump in, but I will say it for you as requested. Um, Shauna asks, could we speak about what it means to do land healing and how that's a value of each courses and vision for our students and ourselves? I really think that um, like we as people are a microcosm over a bigger Organis organism that's the, our planet. And so I feel like, uh, as mentioned before, is like when we heal our earth, we heal ourselves and vice versa. We're working on it together. And we have a phrase, mitakuyeo yasin, which is we're all related. So it's all connected. Amen to that. Mm -hmm. It's great to have everyone tonight, and we're thankful that you joined us here. Yeah. You know, I'm thinking about Ukraine again. Ukraine again, and uh, the uh, I I think many people saw the story of the grandmother that gave the Russian soldier the sunflower seeds. And first of all, just to be giving seeds as you yeah. know a weapon is enough. But then to tell them that, you know, I hope it grows up out of your ass when you're composting and dead, right? Or whatever she said, right? Powerful casting. Right. Uh, <laughs> but I, I mean, the, the, one of the things that I'm getting from watching that situation unfold as we are is the power of the individual with a handful of sunflower seeds and the power of community when we work together and align our intentions, right? And you can stare down those tanks. Um, I'm only hoping that 
my people see that modeled example. And when it gets serious here in the US, as I am sure it will do, um, that we know how to follow that example and demand what we know is right and true. Hmm. Thank you. Yep. Um, Maya, do you have the Afghan Relief Fund link to post in the chat? Yes, I posted it before. I'll post it again right now. Thank you. And um, I think we're probably over our time now. So I want to say a big thank you to Wanda and Sunshine and Charles for joining us, to all of you, to Carmen for your contribution, and all of you who've asked such beautiful questions and participated and listened and held space, um, to Maya for all the things you do behind the scenes that make all this work possible and our whole Earth Activist training team. I think Elizabeth is on here too, who uh, helps us with all of our social media stuff and our beautiful graphics. Um, to Guy and Isis for your wonderful interpretation again. And we always like to kind of sing and dance our way out. So Charles is gonna put up a song that um, we really love, um, and um, it's John Baptiste singing Freedom, right? Yeah. And we invite you to turn on your video if you want, put it in gallery view, and dance our way out of this session. And for those of you who might be interested in taking your education further, we do have uh, a first module of our resilient land design program that's starting in just a couple of weeks from now. Um, that is our, it's like three linked six week courses that go deeper into the science and theory and practice. Um, the first one is around design and mapping and water systems. The second one is around soil and grassland and animal systems. And the third one is around forestry and food forests. Um, it's also the beginning of our regenerative land management program. We try to have a lot of flexibility so that you can take any one of those modules or you can take all three. You can take them as standalone courses or you can take the whole regenerative land management program and get your diploma and um, hopefully come out with the skills you need to manage a piece of land regeneratively and help us spread the word about that. Uh, we really love to take people deeper. In. All right now, let's dance our way out.